you've been watching me for a while, you might have seen my previous tutorial series called Logical Redstone, where I explained some digital logic concepts and showed off some cool circuits. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not happy with that series. Don't get me wrong, it'll stay on the channel forever, but I think we can do way better. Welcome to episode one of a brand new series, Logical Redstone Reloaded. My goal for this series, among many other things, is to provide the most comprehensive, easy to follow, and engaging course about Logical Redstone ever seen on YouTube. Now, if you're brand new to Minecraft, Digital Logic, or even both, don't worry. Today, we're gonna start from the absolute beginning. And even if you're not new, you'll still wanna watch this. I guarantee you'll learn something. I also put timestamps that describe each section of the video, so feel free to skip around. Without further ado, let's get started. For this entire series, I'm gonna use version 1.18.2 of Minecraft Java Edition. Why 1.18? Well, it doesn't matter that much, but 118 is the version of the most popular logical redstone servers at the time of uploading this. If you use a slightly different version like 117 or 119 and you play in single player, then everything in this series will probably still work. What matters more is that you play in Java Edition, not Bedrock Edition. If you try to build anything from this series on Bedrock, there's a chance it just won't work at all. So I really do not recommend trying that. I would explain why I prefer Java over Bedrock, but my friend Purplers did a beautiful job doing that already. So if you're interested in that, check out his video in the description. Now, another thing you might want to know is how to make a good world for redstone. Obviously, there's a ton of freedom here, but here's what I like to do. On create new world, I make it creative, turn cheats on, and set the difficulty to peaceful. Then in the game rule section, I like to turn off all the spawning stuff, drop stuff, and uh, world update stuff too. Those three categories are just annoying for redstone. And in world options, I like to turn structures off and I choose the super flat preset called redstone ready. And just like that, you have a beautiful world for redstone. One last thing you might want to set up for yourself before getting started is a texture pack, because in my opinion, the vanilla textures are not that great. There are so many options out there for texture packs. Personally, I use one I made called the Matte Pack, and the link for it is in the description. It's mostly just a mixture of packs made by other people that I put together. The first thing to understand about redstone, and really Minecraft in general, is that the game runs on a tick system. There are 20 game ticks per second, and so each game tick is a 20th of a second. Now, the kind of weird thing is, game ticks are actually not used that often to measure time in the logical redstone community. Instead, we often measure things in terms of redstone ticks, which are defined as 10 per second, not 20. In other words, every two game ticks is equal to one redstone tick. This is because a lot of redstone components operate on a two game tick clock anyways, so I guess it's just kind of easier. But the point is, from here on out, including this video, whenever I say ticks, I'm referring to redstone ticks, which are one tenth of a second. Okay, with that out of the way, let's take a look at the most common components in logical redstone. Dust, repeaters, comparators, and torches. Redstone dust is the classic. It's essentially the wire that you use to transmit redstone signals. You can place it on almost any flat surface in the game, from solid blocks to glass to even upside down half slabs, but it can't exist without something under it. Each individual dust has a signal strength associated with it, which is just a value from 0 to 15. 0 being no power, all the way up to 15 being full power. One way to give redstone full power is by placing a power source, like a redstone block. As you can see, the adjacent dust receives a full signal strength of 15. Then, that value decays by 1 for every dust along the wire, until eventually it reaches 0. But before it reaches 0, you can use redstone to power things. For example, I can power a redstone lamp by hooking up a small wire to it and powering the wire. And if you're only using dust, then this transmission is instantaneous, there's no delay. Okay, but if signal strength always decays to zero, then how do we transmit longer signals? For that, we need a redstone repeater. A repeater converts any signal from 1 through 15 into a signal of 15. For example, if I have a long redstone line which doesn't quite reach, I can use a repeater to repeat the signal and keep it going. This comes at a cost though, because repeaters introduce delay. By default, a repeater introduces one tick of delay which literally means that the time from this dust being powered to this dust being powered is one tick, or a tenth of a second. You can also right click a repeater to change that delay to two ticks, three ticks, or four ticks. Four is the maximum, and if you right click again, it just goes back to one. Repeaters can also repeat signals from other repeaters, or really any other power source. 
And a really cool feature of repeaters is that they can be locked by powering them from the side with another repeater or comparator. This makes them hold their current state of either powered or unpowered. Okay, now before I move on to comparators, let's talk about what happens when you power solid blocks with redstone. There are actually two types of power that solid blocks can receive. Soft power, which I'll represent with orange, and hard power, which I'll represent with red. If you power a solid block with redstone dust, like this, that block becomes soft powered. Additionally, any solid blocks that redstone dust is sitting on directly also become soft powered. But if you power a solid block with a repeater, it becomes hard powered. Both soft powered and hard powered blocks are very similar. They can both activate components next to them, like lamps or doors. They can also both conduct to repeaters and comparators, and by extension, this means that you can actually pass signals through walls like this. The main difference is that a soft-powered block will not activate redstone around it, whereas a hard-powered block will. Alright, with that out of the way, let's move on to comparators. Unlike repeaters that have one input, comparators have three inputs, the rear and the two sides. Comparators have a delay of one tick, which is the same as a default repeater. They also have two different modes, indicated by the little knob on the front. By default, when you place them, they're in compare mode. But if you right click and turn that little knob on, they change to subtract mode. Now, if you're not using the side inputs and you're just using the rear, a comparator is actually really simple. All it does is copy the signal strength from the rear to the output. For example, if I give it a signal strength of seven, it outputs a seven. It's basically a worse version of a repeater. But if you choose to use the side inputs, then the mode it's in actually matters. In compare mode, if either of the two side inputs are greater than the rear, it outputs a zero. Otherwise, it keeps outputting the rear, like normal. For example, if I have an eight in the rear and a seven and nine on the sides, well, nine is greater than eight, so we output zero. But if I have an eight in the rear and five and six in the sides, well, neither of them is greater than eight, so we just keep outputting eight. Switching to subtract mode, now the comparator will actually perform a subtraction. It takes the rear minus the greater of the two sides and outputs the result. So if I have a three in the rear and a one and two in the sides, the comparator will do three minus the greater of the two sides, which is two, and three minus two is one. As another example, if I have a three in the rear and a four in the side, the comparator will do three minus four, which is negative one. But signal strength never goes below zero, so it actually just outputs a zero. And this leads to a really cool property of subtract mode, which is that if you give full power to the side, nothing can get through. You've essentially canceled this comparator because anything minus 15 is gonna be zero or less. And I'll be honest with you, subtract mode is a lot more common in logical redstone. I almost never use compare mode. Just like repeaters, comparators hard power blocks. And on top of that, they can pass signal strength through blocks. If I give it a seven in the rear, hard power a block, and place a redstone dust, we get a seven. Another super useful feature of comparators is that they can tell you how full a container is. For example, if I have a barrel completely full of items, then a comparator will read 15. If it's only somewhat full, I get a signal strength that is a representative fraction of how full it is. Maybe a seven or eight if it's halfway, or a 13 if it's mostly full, you get the idea. And naturally, if it's empty, you get a zero. All right, last but not least is the redstone torch. Redstone torches are power sources that give off full power. They can be placed on the top or side of a block. They hard power blocks above them, and they can activate stuff next to them. This includes underneath them if they're on the side of a block. The only exception is the block they're attached to, which is completely unaffected. However, if you power the block they're attached to, the redstone torch becomes unpowered. This can be used to invert a redstone signal, and the inversion has a delay of one tick. If a redstone torch inverts too many times too quickly, it's possible for it to burn out, and it will stay burnt out until it receives an update. And that concludes the four main components used in Logical Redstone. Of course, there are still pistons, observers, hoppers, and more, but those just don't get used very often. 
And in my opinion, if you're not moving blocks, I feel like you just never need to use pistons. In my experience, no matter what circuit I'm designing, I tend to find cleaner solutions using just these guys. These four components will allow you to do pretty much whatever you want in a clean and elegant way. Next up, let's talk about the most important blocks for logical redstone. I already talked about solid blocks and how they can be soft powered or hard powered. But another really useful block type is transparent blocks. Some common transparent blocks are glass, glowstone, ice, or upside down slabs. Me personally, I use glass the most. Transparent blocks have two really useful properties. First, redstone can only travel up onto a transparent block, but not down. This gives you a really easy way to make one-way wires. And second, if you place a transparent block on top of a redstone staircase, the redstone can still slip through it, compared to solid blocks, which would block the redstone from getting through. This has some really cool side effects, like being able to create a glass tower to send redstone straight upwards. Or, let's say I have two redstone wires and I want to move them both down by one block. I can't do that with solid blocks because, well, the redstone on the bottom wire is getting blocked off. But if I instead use a glass here, the redstone slips through. And it works. There's no more interference between these two wires. That's pretty cool. Another useful block is the target block. A target block is a solid block with a special property that any redstone dust placed next to it will be automatically pointed to it. This is really useful when it comes to compacting redstone circuits. Target blocks also give off a signal when hit by a projectile, but that's not really used in logical redstone. We just like them for the redirecting property. Next, we have the redstone block. As you saw earlier, it gives full power to redstone next to it. That includes redstone on top of it and underneath it. And finally, containers are pretty useful as well. They can be used with a comparator to create any signal strength you want on the fly. All right, we've got tons of components and blocks now. This is really cool. The last thing you might want to use when you create circuits is some form of input and output. Starting with input, the main ones I like to use are levers, buttons, and pressure plates. Levers are pretty simple. They just attach to a block. When they're turned on by a player, they hard power that block. Buttons also attach to blocks. When they're pressed by a player, they hard power that block with a short pulse. A stone button pulse is 10 ticks long, while a wooden button pulse is 15 ticks long. Pressure plates can only be placed on top of blocks. They hard power the block underneath them whenever you or another entity is standing on them. And by the way, levers, buttons, and pressure plates can also activate things around them. Now for output, there are only two real options in my opinion. Redstone lamps and trapdoors. Redstone lamps are the classic. They simply light up when they're powered. Anytime you want to read a signal or make a screen, they're super, super useful. The only flaw about redstone lamps is that while they turn on instantly, they take two ticks to realize that they're not being powered anymore. This can actually be really annoying when you're trying to read the state of a circuit, because during those two ticks, it's not really telling you the correct state. Luckily though, trapdoors don't have that problem. They update instantly both ways. So you can always rely on them to give you an accurate reading of a circuit at any time. And I'm such a fan of this property that my texture pack actually retextures trapdoors that are on the side of blocks to look like lamps. And that concludes input and output. At this point, you've learned literally everything commonly used in logical redstone. If you're brand new to this and this seemed like a ton of information, you're right. It was, but I promise you, after just a few weeks of playing around with redstone yourself, all of these properties become second nature. My brain doesn't even think about redstone in terms of like soft powering and hard powering anymore. I've just internalized how it behaves, and I think most people get to that point pretty quickly. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is mods. Don't get me wrong, all the redstone we build will always work in the vanilla version of the game, but there are some mods that are incredibly useful for redstone building. My two favorites are World Edit and Carpet. These are both fabric mods, so you'll need to learn how to install fabric first. I've left a bunch of links in the description for how to do that. It's not that bad. Once you've installed World Edit and Carpet, come back to this part of the video and I'll show you how I use them. Let's start with World Edit. The idea of World Edit is to create a selection and then run commands that manipulate the world to help you build faster. To make a selection, start by running slash slash wand. This gives you the default selection tool, which is a wooden ax. Left click a block to set the first corner of your selection and right click a block to set the second corner. All the space between those two corners is your selection. WorldEdit has a ton of commands, but I really only use like five of them. 
set, move, copy, paste, and stack. Let's do a really quick rundown of how these work. Set will set your selection to a block. For example, if I want to set the floor to stone, I would select the first corner, then the second corner, and run slash slash set stone. You can also use set to remove things by setting the area to air. So if I run slash slash set air, the floor gets removed. Move moves your selection. For example, if I want to move this circuit by three blocks up, I would select the circuit like this, and then I'd run slash slash move three up. Or I can also just look up and run slash slash move three. Copy and paste are used to, well, <laughs> copy and paste. For example, let's say I want to copy this circuit and paste it somewhere else. First I select it, then I run slash slash copy, go over here and run slash slash paste. And lastly, we have stack. Stack is really useful when you want to copy something a bunch of times. For example, if I have a repeater here and I want to have 10 more repeaters just like it, all I need to do is select the repeater and run slash slash stack 10. It will then copy and paste it 10 more times in the direction that I'm looking. WorldEdit also has some flags that I use sometimes. The most common one is dash A. If you include this flag when you run a command, it will ignore air. So let's say I want to move this piece into this piece. By default, if I try to do that, it <laughs> won't work because selections always have straight edges. But if I run the same command with dash A, it perfectly fits because it didn't move the air. Now let's talk about carpet mod. Just like with world edit, there's a ton of stuff in this mod, but I only use a few things. First, they have a toggle called creative no clip that you can enable with this command right here. It allows you to fly through blocks, but you still land on them when you stop flying. And that is just so useful when you're trying to build tight circuits. I also use carpet mod to speed up, slow down, or even freeze the game. As I said in the beginning, there are 20 game ticks per second, but you can change that with tick rate. For example, running slash tick rate 5 will slow down the game to 5 ticks per second, or 1 fourth speed. On the flip side, running slash tick rate 500 will speed up the game a ton. You can also freeze the game with slash tick freeze. Once the game is frozen, you can step through time with slash tick step. For example, if I want to jump ahead by one redstone tick or two game ticks, I would run slash tick step two. And to unfreeze the game, just run tick freeze again. And with that, I believe I covered pretty much everything I needed to cover for a beginner. If you think I missed anything, leave a comment and I'll try to mention it. Starting next episode, I'm going to assume you've already played around with redstone yourself for a good amount of time and that you've gotten comfortable with the basics. And yeah, I, uh, I really hope you guys enjoy this series and are as excited for it as I am. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Peace out, guys.